quiet. Uh, just have to start walking up and down now. So we just got a guest here. Anyway, I'm going to make you aware that this video is solely focused on knowledge. Okay, it is not a skills based video. All right, I'm going to give you some skills based essays, which I've written on interpretations. But I did give you a very clear, a very clear way of answering interpretations questions last time I saw you. So you should have it in your head. And I can basically just tell you right now what you should do, okay, with your interpretations. Identify. Criticize. Okay. And when you criticize, you say the strength. Why is it convincing? Then you explain why the interpretation isn't convincing. And then you come to a mini conclusion. And you take a interpretation by interpretation approach. So you you analyze one interpretation, analyze a second, analyze a third with the same structure for each one. Okay. Do not criticize what is not in interpretation. We don't do that. Okay. Also, don't take a line by line approach. The first line won't give you the overall meaning of an interpretation. You need to read it all. So you don't need to analyze every line. You need to find what's important. That is the evaluative part of this. So you evaluate. Evaluation value what is of value evaluate your interpretation right now i said that let's get started guys let's get started so let me see i think i can use this i can right i, do, I like the other ones but I was, I was downstairs in english there and i was like this is a why this is okay just yeah um, right yeah so you can't see any of the slides she can't see the slides well that's very annoying isn't it so i'm gonna have to present my slides okay oh i can just bring it here i think right no why can't you see the slides they're right here on the meet. If she's on the meet, you can see them. I'm just literally sharing this meet. Oh, is there a slide for this? Because I can't see. It's on the Google <coughs> meet. It's literally there. I can't do it in any other way. Yeah? It's literally there. Yeah? Sorry, Toons. I don't know why you can't see it. Those those slides are on your Google Slides, right? Yeah, Mr. Eagles put them up, right? So like 42 yeah. slides. All right. This, this, you can see this on your Google Slides. Yes? How do I develop my exam skills? That's on your Google Classroom, isn't it? Mm. It's a great waste of video time. Right, anyway, right, okay, right, look, please. All right, can you see it? No, it's on there. It is on there. Yeah. Then fantastic. All right, then I'm going to talk about the end of mutiny. So she can hear me. So you can hear me, Tombs. There we go. So look, let's talk about the end of mutiny. The end of mutiny has a range of causes. Now, we've discussed this very recently. So this is perfect revision. Okay. There are religious and cultural causes to this. Lord Dalhousie. Consular General of India, okay, within the East India Company. I mean, nice and quietly. Just like within the East India Company, I've just started anyway. Okay, they um, he introduced the Widows Remarriage Act. Shh, guys, guys. He introduced the Widows Remarriage Act. Why is this so important? It's very important because the majority of people in India are Hindus, and because they're Hindus, they follow that religion, and in that religion there is a tradition. And it's not a very nice tradition, okay? But there was a tradition of when a husband died, his wife would be burnt at a funeral pyre. It's called Suti Asati burning. You're very aware of this. You know this. It's just revision. Now, Lord Dalhousie thought with his civilizing mission, that this was zao zao cruel, okay? Very cruel. Didn't like it. And so he introduced the Widow's Remarriage Act. Now, what this fostered across India was a popular resentment against the East India Company, against the British Empire. Pourquoi? Why? Why was this? Because they felt like their Hindu values were being trampled upon. There was a great worry that they would be converted. There were a lot of missionaries in India as it was. Okay? So they thought that their religious values would be undermined. Which was bad. So they don't want that. Okay? Also, Oud was annexed in 1857 under the doctrine of lapse. Okay? Under the doctrine of lapse. Now, that's very, very bad, isn't it? Okay? Because a lot of the sepoys' land was taken there, so they lost a lot of territory. And, of course, the short-term spark, Ellis, okay, is the rumours of pig fat and cow fat on the Lee Enfield rifle ammunition. And, again, I said rumours because I can't – I've looked into this deeply and I can't certify whether it was true. I can't prove it either way. However, I've told you before, I'm going to tell you again, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. The fact is, is that the sepoys believed it. The majority of people in India seem to believe it. And if they believe it, they've got another cause for angst, another cause for anger. And under these range of different factors, okay, some socioeconomic, some cultural and religious, okay, the sepoys were about. And also, sorry, one other thing, okay, 
in Nepal, the Gurkhas, who are a very famous regiment, okay, and I'll explain why, because they're very tough mountainous people, um, very fit, uh, very fit, young, short, but very fit and very, very uh, mobile men. Uh, they have been brought into the East India Company and this upset the caste system. So you must remember the caste system. The caste system is very important to understanding Indian culture at the time. So in many, many ways, religiously, socioeconomically, in terms of a feudal system, really a caste system which they had, which didn't allow for social mobility, Indian culture has been trampled on by a cultural oppressor, by this oppressive British Empire. So there's deep anxieties and worries amongst the sequels. Now, the events, you know, it starts with not the leader. He isn't the leader, but he's a significant individual. OK, now you've, I've showed you a film version. It makes out like he was like, you know, he's on a one man crusade. Okay, but no one helped him, okay? But no one stopped him either. So he attacked, he mutinied, he mutinied against his East India officers, okay? Uh, and he failed, okay? He wasn't able to rouse the rest of his comrades. And for that reason, he tried to commit suicide. He stood on his gun, shot himself in the chest. Now, when he did this, it failed, but he was hung. And he was told to admit to um, chewing, I think, is it GAT? Or, yeah, GAT. So he, uh, uh, like something, a drug which would make you very high. And he refused to. Anyway, we've got the Siege of Delhi as well, which famously was counter-sieged, okay? So it looked like the British Empire wouldn't do very well there, all right? But we had men like Hodson of Hodson's Horse, who is a 152-mile ride in 72 hours. When did he sleep, guys? When did he sleep? Did he horse sleep? I don't know, okay? After the journey, they say, why the long face? I don't know. Right, so, but he did it. And he famously executes Shah Bahadur, the second's grandsons and grandsons, all right? Now, you've got the Siege of Cornwall massacre with Nana Sahib, okay? So these are our significant individuals here. Also, you've got Rani of Lakshmi Bai, okay? She led a campaign against the British because of the doctrine of lapse, because there was no male heir, all right? <laughs> so the consequences are very important, okay? And they're long-lasting. The Indian, East India Company is dissolved. Goodbye. And hello to the British Raj, all right? Okay. Um, Clemency Canning, he's the first viceroy. He introduces three Indian universities, one in Calcutta, definitely, still exists today. So that's an amazing stretch of continuity. He also continues with Lord Dalhousie's railway reforms, as we know. That's great civilization that opened up India economically, right? People that lived in small villages in India, okay, would be able to travel further than ever done before. So it opened up things for Indians, but I think we can't deny the principal motive for building railways in India was to extract wealth. Okay, I think we have to accept and admit that, all right? <coughs> um, so, yeah, Clemency Canning leads the golden age of the British Raj. Okay, it's quite interesting. Right, let's move on. Oh, we, oh, two, oh okay, two of you can see it. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Let's move on, if we can. I'm on the wrong thing. So, okay, the Chosa War. Now, uh, guys, all right, so basically, there's a lot of war. I don't know if I should put this on one slide. I could have. Um, friction with the Bantu peoples, okay? So these frictions, in fact, I can just put this up like this. Okay, so these frictions were, um, yeah, cultural, religious, linguistic, attitudes towards justice and, and uh, religion, social economics. There's a lot of similar things you'll see on these slides. Discovery of diamonds in Kimberley in 1867. Also, there's another social economic one, which I haven't put in there, which I should have, and you're going to know what it is. It's the 1873 Coinage Act, okay? The abandonment of the biometallic system. That leads to a period of bellicosity and jingoism, or jingoism and bellicosity, because Britain's economy is in the doldrums, and the only way, the only way to increase economy is through territorial acquisition within this time frame, within this historical zeitgeist. How do we know that? Because in 1902, a great book was written. It's called Imperialism. It's by Hobson. Now, you might want to drop it in. It's good knowledge. I know it doesn't quite fit into that, that time period, though, but it's the economic theory of the tomorrow, I guess, on there. But I oh, know it's, it's interesting. Maybe you could drop it in somewhere. You can work that into your essay somewhere. I, I still think it's good knowledge. Right. <coughs> Colonial Secretary Lord Carnarvon. He's, a, he's got a confederation policy. Why has he got a confederation policy? Well, it's very, very interesting why he's got one. Okay. Because he started one in Canada. So he's got form. So I did a little bit more research around Lord Carnarvon. You know, it's called uh, Wikipedia. But anyway, right. So Lord Carnarvon actually started a um, confederation in Canada. He had actually applied it to Canada. So he had this model, this way of thinking, and he wanted to apply it to South Africa, okay? He wanted that confederation, all right? That was, a, that was a long-standing ambition. And what's really interesting is, even though he quits his post as colonial secretary, and you know how important colonial secretary is, the role of colonial secretary is so influential. 
because in history, we don't like individuals. We're all about those social economics. But you know what? There's such a centralization of power under colonial secretary. They really are globally powerful, okay? So globally powerful. And he wants that confederation in South Africa. And he installs two puppet leaders there, really, okay? Two colonial administrators. One is Sir Bartle Freire. The other one is Sir Theophilus, or Theophilus Shepstone, okay? So he puts them on the ground. They institute his policies. The men on the spot. The men on the spot, guys, all right? So um, that's incorrect, okay? So that shouldn't be there. That's really stupid. I should have uh, changed that, okay? Now, the events of this, okay, so what do they do? Um, in the Chosen War, they divided the land. Ignore that. That's really annoyed me. That's really annoying. That's all, I need to change that. All right, I'm going to change it and re-upload it. All right, so basically, Chosa lands were divided into uh, 11 strips, okay? And the Chosa troops were chased on horseback, okay? So you want to take some notes about that? You might want to do that. No, they were chased on horseback. So what the British did was divide the land, okay, into 11 different parts. And then they, on horseback, they chased the Chosa army for until they capitulated. Don't forget also that a young girl made a prediction that um, if the Chosa destroyed all their crops and all their livestock, that the white man would leave the land as well. That was terrible. That caused a famine. That didn't work. Okay, so, okay, there are reasons why the Chosa lost. So, um, this is, again, incorrect, okay, here. So, I don't know, really, I've literally had a massive brain fart there, so we're going to ignore that. But the consequences were, Carnival's ambitions moved towards, uh, moved to well, he looks like he's moving towards what he wants, okay? So he wants to dominate um, the Bantu peoples, all right? So it looks good. It looks good so far, all right? I'm going to really update that slide. I'm really enormous up there. Right, anyway, right, the Zulu War. Now, this is all correct. Do you know what? Do you know what I've done? I've labelled them incorrectly. What an absolute wally. Right, okay, let me just change that right now. Okay, so let me get in there. I'm thinking, how could I have done that? And like, I, well, see, I was right where I was wrong when I was wrong when I was right. That's just really annoying. So I don't really need to re-upload this later. I need to change that. Okay, so that's really annoying. Sorry, guys. Sorry. I can't, literally can't believe I've done that. It's just like so stupid. Right, okay. This is maybe why you should QA your own slides before you... Uh, I'll get someone else to do it. Right, so mutual apologies, guys. Mutual apologies. And I think they're just slightly in the, in the wrong order there, aren't they? So I'd obviously want that. Yeah. Okay, right, so let's actually do that properly now. I'm really sorry, guys. I'll never do that again. Sorry. Right, um, so yeah, this Chosa, this Chosa loss, it leads, it has important consequences because the British carry on with their better coast action. So it's going to lead to a Zulu capitulation. It's going to lead to a First World War. It's going to lead to a Second World War, all right? It's, it's going to continue. It's not going to stop, is it? So, okay, <coughs> let's do something correct now. Right, okay, right, so here we are. Right, I'm really gutted on video on this now. But anyway, right, okay, right. So, cultural, religious, so again, Zulu. Now, with the Zulus, okay, they've got a totally different attitude towards rule of law, all right? Now, in Britain, what happens before you're killed by the government? What do they nicely do before they give themselves permission to do that? What do you get? Trial. Now, in Zulu culture, Chetswayo, King Chetswayo, it doesn't go with trials. He's the chief, okay? They've got a very kind of more directly hierarchical structure. So if King Chetswayo says you're dying, what happens to this? Yeah, there you go. Okay, very simple, isn't it? So basically, some of his relatives, I think one of his daughters got married someone, wasn't quite working out. They tried to run into British uh, territory. They were in British territory. They were arrested. The British didn't like what they did there. Okay, and also Sir Bartle Frey ordered all um, non-white people, so all, all black people in South Africa to disarm as well. Okay, he wanted them to disarm. And King Chetswayo's response was, well, the British disarm too, okay? So you know Zulu culture. You know how warlike it is. You know that Shaka Zulu started that culture and built an empire. You know that Shaka Zulu designed a thrusting spear and a shield, okay? All right? And they had a knob carry as well, just to bang people's heads open. And they had a very uh, adept war strategy as well with the bull's horn technique, technique where they attack people in the flank. So whilst they didn't have technology, they were a very war proficient culture, okay? Which is why their tribe had grown and grown and grown. Okay, so they've got this history and the British completely underestimate them, all right? And again, social economics, I should again put the 1873 Coinage Act in there, all right? We've got Carnivon's policy. So you see, there's a lot of stuff about South Africa, okay? If you're asked about a certain conflict, you can reuse it, you can reuse the same information because you've got the same dynamics at play, 
right? And you might be asked a question which asks, like, you know, uh, why was there conflict in South Africa between this time and this time, okay? Or, you know, there's so many different questions I can ask you. They might, they might ask you to focus more on a Boer War. They might focus over, like, just conflict in South Africa. I've got a feeling something's going to come up there, hopefully, because, you know, it's, it was one of the highlighted uh, bullet points. I definitely think Mr. Reaver was right about picking the economic history. I think something will come up there. Okay, I think something's going to come up there. And you've been well versed in that. But anyway, let's focus on this. Okay, so, but it doesn't go well, does it? Gadzooks, okay? They lose the Battle of Island Mana. Oh, no. Humiliation. Lord Chelmsford, do you know what he didn't do? He didn't put his troops into even defensive wagons. He fought, yeah, a couple of rounds shooting at the, uh, the natives and they'd run off. He didn't do his due diligence. He didn't do his intelligence. He completely underestimated it. Now, you've got the Battle of Rules Drift. Okay, and I've shown the video with Michael Caine. Yeah, okay. Now, I'm not saying that's a completely accurate history, but, it's, you know, basically the British were retreating. They were attacked again by the Zulus. Okay, and they held out. Okay, it's like a heroic defence. After this, um, Lord Chelmsford gets reinforcements. He was supposed to be relieved of his command because he was so awful, but he attacks the, the capital of Alundi and destroys the Zulus. Okay, all right. It's, it's a capitulation. Also, sorry, at the Battle of Adamwana, um, the British quartermaster didn't give out the ammunition quickly enough, so that's another core mistake. You know, a nice little detail which you can add in there. And the consequences was the humiliation of the British, First World War, Conrad's ambitions uh, pos uh, moved on. So even though the British have won, it's like a poor victory. I wouldn't say it's a Pyrrhic victory because they're moving along towards this confederation, but it was hard earned. And, you know, come on, man, they've got guns. They're losing to people with spears. Like, it shouldn't happen, right? Technologically, they were far ahead. If you've got the uh, technological advantage, you should never lose, really, in warfare, okay? The side of the best, best technology often wins a battle or a war. Right? So the fact they lost is just, just a bit of a joke. Okay, so um, again, we've got all these key players here. So it's like a very similar theme. And this same key theme is going to come up again, a very similar theme. So we have got the first Boer War, okay? And I spoke to you about this before. Now, this is a different, different kettle of fish because they're not fighting a band two peoples now, okay? They're fighting European settlers. They're fighting the Boers. They're fighting farmers. And you know why these Boers are so hard to fight against. These are tough guys, okay? These guys live by their horse and their gun, all right? So they're crack marksmen, because they hunt all the time, okay? They're very astute at riding horseback because that's their mode of transport, all right? So they understand the land. They understand what they're doing. Now, there's different attitudes towards slavery. So even though both are European powers, the British are now dev devoted abolitionists, you know? After hundreds of years of making money out of slavery, they decided it was bad. Whilst the, the Boers, okay, they practice it. They were Calvinists. They thought it was justified in the Bible, so they carried on with that practice, okay? That offended the British. The British had a... Uh, had long had an ambition to rid Africa of slavery, okay? Uh, and especially with the work of Dr. Livingstone. So you could, we could wangle that one in there. Dr. Livingstone was a phenomenon. He was a cultural phenomenon. Everyone knew his name. He was a household name. He was a missionary. He wanted to get rid of slavery in Africa. Lo and behold, what do we have? Slavery in Africa. See, it would be very easy to drum up patriotic feeling to have wars with the Boers, okay? Very easy. Very easily done, okay? For that reason, for that culture. So it's a bit strange you've got the civilising mission that actually fits into a motive for war. Now, I'm not saying the British are the good guys. No, we're not saying that, okay? But, you know, I do think the Diamonds in Kimberley might have been a little bit of a motive there as well, okay? Just a little bit. Okay, right, so a little bit of a motive. So, uh, again, he's got his... carnivon has got his uh, confederation policy, Battle Frere's there, Battle Frere's very bellicose. Um, now, by this point, actually, I just want to point out that um, Lord Carnivon is no longer uh, the, the secretary, and... Bartle Fred is uh, quite humiliated. He was he was brought back. He was brought back to Britain and uh, told off for being a bit of a rubbish uh, colonial sorry colonial administrator. So look, with this Boer War, because of the way the the Boers fight, British lose the British lose three battles on the trot, and the most notable is Majuba Hill. And the reason I quote Majuba Hill is because literally they take the highland. Majuba Hill is just beautifully shaped. Okay, it's literally like. A trapezium okay so the British go to the top at night it doesn't work it doesn't work because the Boers fight in a with a new strategy which the British don't understand the British are using Napoleonic um, tactics they're using red uniforms what the British are used to used to are fighting Napoleonic wars right so you get your men and they line up very nice and still 
and the opposition do so, just to give you a nice sporting chance to shoot each other. Okay, and then you shoot boom, one volley, two volley, three volleys, and then you do a, b- a bayonet charge. Then the cavalry come in, and then you use the, you're using the cannons throughout. And then loads of people die, and you shake hands with the opposition at the end, and you take some prisoners. Okay, right. Do you know what I mean like okay? So like they were used to fighting in the pony on strategy. They weren't used to fighting. Um, the birds used a guerrilla war style, a commando system. He used cover fire tactics, okay, against volley fire. It made volley fire completely redundant, okay? It made volley fire, com- I'm going to say it again, it made volley fire completely redundant. So they're using these strategies that the British couldn't defeat. Because, I mean, on paper, on paper, it should be a British win, right? You've got the British Empire. British Empire is mighty, it's huge, it's global, isn't it, Augustine? You've got this massive empire, and then you've got the Boers who are just farmers. But as I've just explained deeply, they're not just farmers, okay? And also, the bulls wear clothes that blend in. Okay, so they're kind of camouflaged. They're harder to shoot. All right? The British troops aren't used to fighting as marksmen. You just fight, you know, you have a target in the distance. You don't pick out individual men. All right? You just fire in a direction and keep your shot low. Okay, so the British are nowhere near as good as the bulls. So it's no wonder the bulls won. Okay. Now, um, yeah, yeah, Pomery Colley himself is shot through the head. Okay. Right, so he was shot through the head, through his forehead. Okay, he wasn't shot through the back of the head. He died fighting, so at least we can say he met a brave but useless death. Um, and the consequences, well, they're huge. There's no getting away from this. This is this isn't losing a battle. This is losing a war. And like some people say, you know, it wasn't a war. It was just free battles. And you know, the British let it happen. Why? Because we've got a prime minister who I should have written on there again. All right, so we have got Gladstone. Now Gladstone didn't want to fight this war. Gladstone isn't about territorial expansion, okay? So you can see his philosophy meeting actuality there, okay? Meeting a reality. So um, the gold trade from the Boers was controlled from 1886 to 1902. Continuity of slavery. Lord Conovan's strategy defeated in the short term. So look, Lord Conovan's grandiose strategy of this confederation, it doesn't happen until 1910, all right? And this became an overriding obsession of radical Joseph Chamberlain's later on. That's another consequence that Joseph Chamberlain would engineer another war. They'd try and take it through the Jameson raid. Okay, the British were obsessed with taking it because it was so resource rich. So we've got all those significant individuals there. Paul Kruger was part of a triumvirate leader. <coughs> he was very antagonistic towards the British. He's more kind of influential in the Second Boer War, where he makes the British pay taxes on uh, British businessmen pay taxes on dynamite in his region. He calls the British Uitlanders. So we've got some interesting. Some very interesting stuff there. Now, quickly, let's move on. Let's move on. Imperial colonial policy, 1857. So, guys, this is very connected towards the uh, inter-mutiny. Okay. Now, look, you've got this big act here. So, this is the one to remember. I don't know, like, on later parts of your course, it comes up again. Government of India Act, 1919, right, or something like that. Okay, so, on the second half of your course, and then you have another one, don't you, in the 1930s. Yeah. So, a lot of Government of India Acts, but this one is easy to remember because in 1958, just after the Indian mutiny, okay? So, East India Company's dissolved. You know that? Like a piece of sugar and tea, okay? Goodbye, it's gone. And India has a Secretary of State in the British Cabinet, okay? So, there you go. The British Cabinet expands to have a, a Cabinet Minister that represents Indian interests. An Indian Council was set up. A vice, that's in India. A vice to replace the Governor General. So, look at this administration. You've got Legislative Council, Provincial Governors, 1,000 civil servants. Now, that sounds quite a lot, 1,000. It's not. That's tiny. India's got a huge population, over 200 million. Look how much bureaucracy we've got in this country today. Civil service is huge. It's bloated, yeah? Well, Boris Johnson says it is. But let's not make a political point, okay? So the civil service is is very big in England today, okay? You've got a lot of people doing a lot of administration. (coughs) NHS is full of it, okay? Like 1,000 for the whole of India? Yeah? Not a lot, really. Not a lot. Okay, um, you've got 565 princely states. Now look at this removal of the doctrine of lapse. So after 1858, you don't have the doctrine of lapse anymore. That's a key consequence, isn't it? That's a key consequence. See, reading the textbook helps, doesn't it, guys? All right, so the doctrine of lapse was removed in 1858, okay? Bilingual Indians were recruited to the civil service. You can bet your bottom dollar they were Brahmins. You can bet your bottom dollar they were Brahmins, okay? So you see this Brahmin class is invited, yeah? Okay, into that sense of privilege there. India's defence. Now look at this. Following the mutiny, British troops were brought in to India at a ratio of one to two. Okay. 
So for every two Indian soldiers, there would be one European soldier. All right. So there's a great sense of equality in India that was developed with regard to European troops. So they wouldn't try this again. Brahmin regiments were disbanded, as were many Bengali ones. Okay. So the Brahmin, they would have that privilege, and they were deliberately mixed from then on. Okay. So future regiments in India would be mixed by caste. Okay, and religion. So there'd be no sense of unity. Although that's not right, is it? It's not quite right. Because actually, do you see what they're doing? They're creating a sense of Indianness by doing this, by making these men of different castes come together, by making these men of different religions come together. They actually foster a sense of nationalism. Okay? Men who may say, oh, no, I'm from this region, and I'm this region, and I'm from this region, I'm from this region, I'm from this caste, I'm not from that caste. Do you see? By the British making the men serve together in the army, they'll become friends. Yeah, you've got, you haven't got anyone else to talk to, right? People forge deep friendships if you spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for like, what, 50 weeks a year together. Yeah, so if you're continuing around each other, that's going to make that very strict car system just weather away a little bit, isn't it? That's very interesting. Now, guys, don't worry. It's on the system. It's not going anywhere. Right, okay. International relations. Now, here's one. Okay, the Brussels Conference, 1876. Should have gone into a bit more detail on this thing. Okay, read the textbook, isn't it marvellous? But anyway, right, so the Brussels Conference. Now, who have we got? We've got the muscles from Brussels himself, okay? King Leopold II. He's a bad guy. This is a bad guy. He's a bad, bad guy, okay? So if you look at most evil men of all time, he comes up quite a lot, King Leopold II. Now, what does he do? He... Wants, he wants the Congo. Yeah, he wants the Congo for himself. Why? Congo has a lot of resources in there, a lot of rubber trees. Yeah, and he's only too willing when he gets in control of it to chop the hands off the men who have that rubber tree. So King Leopold is quite interesting because he actually gets Henry Morton Stanley working for him. He's very interested in Africa. So he pressed Belgium claims to the region, which become his own. So when I say Belgium claims, and I said becomes his own because the Congo becomes his personal property. It isn't the Kingdom of Belgium. It was his. It's like King Leopold land, okay? He literally owned it himself. Now, Africans were racistly described as being incapable of developing natural resources. So European intervention was necessary. This is, this is a decision there, okay? Infrastructure, like roads and great lakes, were to be developed, okay? So why do you think they're going to extract resources out of Africa? <coughs> An international association should be developed to coordinate European efforts, which it was. Okay, so you know, von Bismarck in 1884, okay, to 1885, decides that all nations should be permitted to trade in the base of Congo, but in principle would belong to Belgium. And the reason that Belgium got the Congo is because Belgium was a non entity in Europe, let's be honest, very small country, wasn't exactly a mover or a shaker. Its army was negligible, okay, but you know what? That's all to the good. It's a nice little neutral country. It, it had when it was created by the British after the um, Battle of Waterloo. Okay, the British made Belgium a country. Okay, they just thought, oh, we'll just take this off France, so France won't be as powerful. It's a small but little industrial region. Okay, and um, that's going to be a neutral country. All right? So because it wasn't powerful, Britain, France, and Germany decided, you know what? You can take the Congo. Because if France or Britain or Germany got it, it would upset the balance of power. So free trade in Africa... No slave trade. That was very important. Yeah. Slavery is bad, but chopping off people's hands is okay. Um, I'll be very glued for the people watching this on YouTube. Very glued. Okay. I'm not serious about that. Right. All charity, exploration, mission work should be protected. Okay. Civilizing mission. All powers had to communicate with each other about ter territory planes and expansion. Avoid war. This was one of Bismarck's idea. Look, we all get together. Africa's massive. There's loads of resources. We all get rich. Wars are expensive. Outcomes are risky. Don't have war. Don't have a war. There's no need to have a war. We can just negotiate. We can all get rich. Plenty of land for everyone. So George Tubman Goldie, just so you know, was there. Okay. And he pressed claims to Niger, which he got. Okay. Bismarck argued with him about this. But after Bismarck fell from power, Britain got its way on Niger. So George Tubman Goldie would buy it, would sell, sorry, Niger and parts of Nigeria to the British Empire for over $1 million. So George Tubman Goldie. All right. So he's a very important man, a very important man. He's like Cecil Rhodes, but he's not Cecil Rhodes. And he wasn't such a self-publicist. <coughs> so if you're looking at me like, mm, I don't know who George Tom Goldie is, you know, you need to revise tonight, okay? You know, he's a significant individual, okay? He's a significant individual. Right, okay. That's it.
That's it. That's my little speech show, guys. That's it. So I'm going to stop the video right there. Let's stop recording. Stop. Stop recording.